Chapter 30, Hematologic Problems. Let's begin with anemia. There are three categories <coughs> that cause anemia. Overall, anemia is a condition wherein you have low red blood cell count. There are three main categories as I mentioned. Uh, you already know that this is regarding oxygen transport. So this is still a part of perfusion and the fact that this is uh, connected with oxygen delivery but unlike perfusion problems in the cardiac chapters from chapters 32 uh, to 37 wherein it is a um, it is the um, transport of the um, red blood cells and oxygen this one is uh, talking about the carriers okay uh, these are red blood cell problems and the rest of the chapter will also cover the other two blood cell disorders namely thrombocytopenia and neutropenia so we will also touch on lymphomas and um, leukemias now regardless of the problem these are uh, arising from various disorders affecting blood cells so chapter 30 as a whole will be talking about red blood cell platelets and white blood cell problems so let's begin figure 30-1 gives you a summary of the overall picture of or categories of how you get anemia one is decreased red blood cell production. This can be either you have a deficiency in the intake, meaning your diet is poor in, let's say, iron, B12, folic acid, or it could also be a problem with, um, although you have good diet, it may be a problem with your ability to absorb them. So it, it may not always be a deficiency in the diet, but it may be a problem with absorbing the these nutrients next is blood loss we have acute and chronic forms of blood loss in acute so most common is trauma you have a aneurysm or that's a ruptured blood vessel a big blood vessel in in the in the case of aneurysms we also have gi bleeding um, GI bleeding can be acute and it can also be chronic so in the chronic blood loss examples we have duodenal ulcers because they tend to be smaller compared to gastric ulcers which are large and therefore fall under acute blood loss uh, duodenal ulcers are smaller uh, colorectal cancer this is you, you, you may actually bleed um, through your lower GI tract but it could also be uh, that the tumor is robbing the body of a lot of the red blood cells meaning the the, the, the tumor and the colorectal cancer is is uh, siphoning all the red blood cells to itself uh, plus of course that could also be coupled with uh, some minor bleeding um, over the over months or years liver disease is under chronic blood loss because your liver is responsible for clotting factor formation and so therefore it will have something to do with your uh, inability to form blood clots or stop bleeding uh, another form is um, liver cirrhosis has complications including esophageal varices you may have heard about that uh, condition um, this results from portal hypertension meaning as the liver dies um, quote unquote you know it, it uh, becomes very um, shrunken or disheveled so it causes the the blood vessels inside it to be compressed okay and then we know that all the blood has to return via the liver so blood coming from the gi tract your lower extremities have to pass through the port of circulation so if they're unable to do that because there's heavy traffic in the port of circulation then varicose veins will form um, not only in the legs the 
uh, rectum but also in the esophagus so varices are pretty much esophageal varices are pretty much varicose veins and these things rupture easily <coughs> causing bleeding and then we have the third category of increased red blood cell production so a few diseases fall under this uh, normally red blood cells have a lifespan of 120 days um, there are conditions wherein it will uh, the body produces uh, defective red blood cells that have a shorter lifespan or the patient experiences complications um, such as in um, ABO incompatibility for instance uh, resulting in hemolytic transfusion reaction acute hemolytic transfusion reaction um, because you have ABO incompatibility so that leads to destruction of red blood cells trauma also um, the example given here is a cabbage and sickle cell disease will be discussed uh, later in the chapter so this is a hereditary disorder causing um, sickling of the cells uh, we will discuss that uh, shortly regardless of the type of anemia each patient with anemia will share the same characteristics or signs and symptoms uh, this is nice to know box here um, showing you patient-centered care and um, uh, cultural and ethnic uh, health disparities meaning sickle cells for instance affects mostly African Americans about um, every three out of ten um, um, babies that have uh, sickle cell disease um, have experience fatal complications and um, there's a larger um, population of sickle cell disease among African Americans compared to other ethnicities. Thalassemia is affecting people around the Mediterranean Sea so that would namely uh, Spain, France, um, who else lives in the Mediterranean? It Italians, uh, you have uh, Turkish, um, Libyans, uh, as well as Greeks. Okay, so they're all around the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a, uh, a disease of a genetic uh, predisposition. Um, Tay-Sachs, you're aware, uh, among the Jewish population. And finally, we have also uh, pernicious anemia, which is a B12 deficiency anemia. And this is common among Scandinavians and also, again, African Americans. This is also nice to know. We can skip this one. Um, well, we, we don't really have to know. Uh, nor normocytic or macrocytic or macrocytic refers to the shape of the red blood cells. Okay, We, we don't need to know that as nurses here's another classification we already mentioned a few of these so they, this is again uh, more examples uh, compared but um, more examples given compared to figure 30-1 so table 30-2 I mean gives you more examples by category um, okay, I'll, I'll mention a few uh, just in passing so again decreased red blood cell production it's either a deficiency in the nutritional intake or it could also be a um, malabsorption syndrome um, same thing for b12 and folic acid because these are nutrients necessary for um, red blood cell production in the case of thalassemias uh, there are two types by the way thalassemia minor and major the only the major type is um, symptomatic um, these people uh, like i said in the people living in the around the mediterranean sea lacks a certain gene <coughs> in their dna that uh, makes them form defective red blood cells uh, it's a sad um, situation because these people uh, will require blood transfusions for the rest of their lives once they develop the disease uh, we will discuss uh, aplastic anemia which can either be most most aplastic anemias are inherited meaning you're born with it 
Uh, it's a bone marrow problem. Uh, however, it can also be acquired when you're exposed to certain chemicals. Um, leukemia is a problem specifically although leukemia you may say oh it's a uh, white blood cell problem not really because the myeloproliferative you know from the term myelo this is referring to the bone marrow so all our blood cells are produced in the bone marrow so this uh, leukemias will not only affect the number of n um, maturity of the um, white blood cells but also those of red blood cells and platelets as well chronic diseases or disorders we will be mentioning um, chronic disorders like heart failure for instance hiv people um, those with hepatitis okay those are chronic diseases some medications will induce anemia like chemotherapy for instance or lead poisoning and finally radiation we've uh, we've seen how these occur in chapter 15 both for chemotherapy and radiation uh, blood loss <coughs> either again acute or chronic <coughs> for increased destruction we will discuss sickle cell disease shortly uh, we'll probably skip this one because it's not very common uh, in the case of physical this is physical destruction number one example here is um, having a prosthetic or a make or a mechanical valve so imagine you have a metal alloy uh, you know a heart valve made of metal alloy or titanium opening and closing so they're bound to have um, to cause mechanical destruction of red blood cells as they are trapped you know be between the valve leaflets which are made of made of metal um, extracorporeal circulation so this is when we remove blood for whatever reason and then return it to the patient such as in apheresis procedures for instance or during um, heart lung bypass uh, surgeries uh, DIC uh, we'll discuss DIC also which has two phases a clotting and a bleeding uh, phase and uh, likewise for TTP, which is a um, um, an inappropriate clotting problem, wherein the um, the platelets in your in the patient's body form clots for no reason, but then uh, since the clots are now or platelets are now used up because they are clotting inappropriately, so when it comes time for the patient to clot they don't so therefore it results in um, bleeding okay so i mentioned regardless of the type of anemia patients will present the same way table 30-3 don't go crazy about this it, the important thing to know here is when does the patient develop symptoms so we know that the normal hemoglobin should at least be 13 grams but uh, once you have mild which is between 10 to 12 there's not really much symptoms yet so at any point you and I could probably have a hemoglobin below 13 uh, but uh, we don't know maybe we'll just have fatigue maybe or be sleepy and tired but uh, nothing else no no other physical symptoms symptoms really appear once we hit moderate and definitely severe levels of uh, anemia so moderate is as long as it's above 6 to 10 the symptoms now appear dyspnea is a common manifestation and fatigue uh, dyspnea because you don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen so the dyspnea may be uh, at rest now so we only have exertional dyspnea in mild okay because you don't have enough um, you have slightly uh, a slight decrease in the uh, oxygen carriers uh, so to say severe definitely you're already below six uh, these patients now require transfusions or other treatments to replenish uh, red blood cells and the oxygen carrying um, capacity of the blood so these are now the symptoms so from uh, various systems of the body are now symptomatic all the way to the skin um, it's important to note that the skin is a distal organ um, so therefore if it 
if it's um, already manifesting in the skin then that's that's pretty bad already a smooth shiny beefy red tongue is typically seen in uh, b12 deficiency anemia so is glossitis glossitis is the um, inflammation of the tongue and you can also have um, a um, a sore uh, or a skin breakdown forming at the corner of your mouth uh, that's also called glossitis these are all nice to know I'll skip them okay this section here will briefly describe each type of anemia and as well as the interventions the signs and symptoms we will skip because all the signs and symptoms are already listed in table 30-3 so we will refer for symptoms back to that chart this is under management so obviously iron deficiency anemia by the word itself is a deficiency in the iron again it's important to keep in mind that it's not always the lack of iron intake it could also be a uh, inability to absorb iron so for instance if you're giving iron supplements or um, iron rich foods such as what's listed here um, you know that um, to absorb iron we need vitamin C correct so it's also important to look at foods that contain vitamin C or take vitamin C supplements or juices when you take in iron so the ones in play here are because the the ones on the test will be b12 uh, chances are they're similar if you look if you compare the food sources that you pick because questions would be like uh, which meal tray or which diet um, sources chosen by the patient indicates understanding of the teaching for instance so if you compare let's say b12 and then folic acid they're really similar so here they have um, uh, look at meat okay although this one um, b12 is specifically red meat so it could be any red meat not necessarily steak but uh, liver for instance is also red meat okay and then you have here liver um, which is red meat I said so they have similarity similarities here this one's in grain and milk dairy products fish and this one also a fish okay so uh, they have similarities um, here's iron and I'm looking for folic acid Oh, I already covered folic acid. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. Just add the vitamin C because, again, for iron, you need that. As I mentioned, malabsorption is the other problem. So, it may not be only a deficiency in the nutritional intake, um, it's not only a diet deficiency, it could be your body's inability to absorb iron. These are some examples of causes. So, we know most of our foods and nutrients are absorbed first in the stomach so if the patient underwent drastic surgery for whatever reason could be from a perforated ulcer or could be uh, for bariatric surgery okay? um, either partial or total gastrectomy surgery um, also those um, that here here's another fact so if you have any problems affecting the duodenum because most iron absorption occurs in there All right or even blood loss blood loss can also cause uh, iron deficiency manifestations like I said uh, here's the glossitis which was already mentioned in the uh, table 30-3 we will skip 30-6 because in the first place we're not making the um, diagnosis here of what type of anemia the patient has plus besides again the signs and symptoms will be the same the physical signs and symptoms uh, although the treatment will vary slightly but there will be commonalities for instance any patient with anemia we know that they have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the because they lack red blood cells then 
uh, our priority therefore is to conserve energy okay so we always encourage to balance activity and rest you're aware that they have exertional dyspnea at mild and then there's already dyspnea at moderate so it, your priority there is um, perfusion okay so energy conservation we, okay so here is a summary of your management of iron deficiency anemia so um, you can add oxygen here too if they're hospitalized they'll be given oxygen supplementation is used ferrosulfate or gluconate uh, there are different forms of iron because not all people will tolerate uh, any form most uh, complaints are G they get GI upset because of the sulfate uh, content uh, so some people may be given ferrous um, iron polysaccharide instead uh, instead of ferrous sulfate different doses also from 150 to 325 or in severe cases they'll get receive transfusions oh here here are the choices for the iron um, don't have to memorize all of them but here is an intrinsic interesting fact especially if you're giving it to the kids um, I assume you know this already that um, liquid iron preparations can stain the teeth so they have to be diluted and given through a straw here are the GI upsets or GI uh, symptoms that will be that make many patients may complain about um, taking iron supplements and here's constipation uh, make sure you just manage that because it may be a cause of the patient not complying with the supplementation because of the resulting um, constipation and here's a summary so you teach the patient about diet so we had the diet list up uh, earlier with the foods um, containing um, high amounts of iron okay let's go to thalassemia as I mentioned these are these are inherited okay these are um, affecting people mostly in um, people in the around the Mediterranean Sea for the uh, countries I mentioned uh, here are again um, some other countries that may have it but mostly um, Greeks Italians uh, Spaniards uh, or even French they have the disease so as I mentioned the, there are two forms the major is the really the symptomatic type okay the, this is the more severe type manifestations the same they have uh, anemia okay um, the problem here is it's a defect in their ability to produce red blood cells there's really no cure for thalassemia it's supportive therapy we try to give them you know nutritious food um, iron folic acid uh, b12 to try to increase the um, red blood cell production uh, but most of the time they will come to the hospital for periodic blood transfusion so they'll probably come once or twice a year or more often and it's the, the cause of death really uh, for these patients are related to blood transfusion uh, complications um, some people get hepatitis C although this is not it's, it's not going to be um, common because we, we do have pretty rigorous screening now um, this would be more right here so older um, blood transfusions let's say below before 1992 yeah it was uh, prevalent uh, during that time but um, since modern blood transfusion now this is almost unheard of uh, like I said most of these people will have to come for blood transfusions and again sadly there will be complications in one of those uh, blood transfusions and they may not make it okay so some at some point they'll have a serious blood transfusion reaction and that would be the cause of death As far as megaloblastic anemias, we're only discussing two, B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency. These are the known causes that contribute to B12 deficiency. Either you're not eating enough 
vitamin B12 in your diet or sorry about that or you have a inability to absorb it B12 is normally absorbed with this enzyme right here the intrinsic factor the patient who has a deficiency of this either starting I mean resulting from gastrectomy gastric bypass celiac disease H. pylori infection um, causes you to lose intrinsic factor again it's necessary that you have this enzyme in order to absorb B12 so if your stomach either does not produce intrinsic factor or let's say you have had these causes here resulting in the same loss of intrinsic factor then therefore you cannot have you cannot absorb dietary b12 however there is still a way to treat you you will have to be given b12 injections okay that would be the only way you will develop you will absorb <coughs> b12 so straight into the bloodstream it's uh, typically given im or subcut other causes are intestinal malabsorption or let's say you got pregnant and then therefore you have a growing uh, uterus, placenta, and a fetus competing with your um, B12 body sources. And the other megaloblastic anemia is folic acid deficiency. So again, similar to B, uh, B12 deficiency, it, it's either a dietary deficiency or a malabsorption problem. So these chronic conditions here, uh, I mean these two here, uh, chronic diseases, uh, or if you had a small bowel resection since folic acid is absorbed in the duodenum. <clears throat> Can also be drug induced, these treatments here, methotrexate and some anti-seizure medications. Alcoholism, uh, which overall also makes you malnourished uh, in the first place uh, can co therefore contribute to anemia as well or with hemodialysis because you lose folic acid during dialysis here is the discussion um, let's go straight at uh, signs and symptoms again please refer back to table 30-3 it's really the same uh, particularly for uh, I believe this is B12, yeah. For pernicious anemia, they have that beefy red tongue, okay, and it's smooth and shiny um, as a result of uh, hypoxia. Okay, so how is it treated? Depending on the cause. So if we determine, if the doctor determines that it is a dietary deficiency then you simply increase the intake if it is again uh, due to your inability to uh, absorb it then you'll be given the um, im or intranasal there's a spray now uh, b12 this is the dose about thousand micrograms per day and as far as folic acid then you of course give uh, folic acid supplementation and same as any other anemia so your priority here again is making sure uh, you balance rest with activity oxygen in the case of a hospitalized patient so it's based on the symptoms and um, of course we try to eliminate the, the cause Anemia of chronic disease. So these are the chronic diseases that lead to anemia. This one is much... Um, the, the treatment for this is to is mainly supportive. Um, there's, because some of these really have no cure. Let's say for HIV, for instance, okay, the patient has them forever. Uh, although we can manage heart failure, or some uh, cancer, okay, let's say myelodysplastic syndromes, for instance, or if you have leukemia, uh, those can be managed. But uh, as far as the anemia that results from these conditions, they are mainly 
uh, supportive in nature, say in the form of um, iron supplementation, B12, folic acid supplements, um, or as you learned in uh, chapter 15 under cancer, we give them uh, epogen, uh, epoitin alpha injections. And that's it. Aplastic anemia. So this can be congenital. You're born with the aplastic anemia or it can be acquired. Uh, idiopathic, this is the autoimmune type. And then acquired are the chemical, those coming from these chemicals or from, uh, it can also be drug induced or as a result for uh, therapy for cancer. So these are your chemotherapeutic drugs here, alkylating agents uh, and anti-metabolites. These are chemo drugs and radiation. So in aplastic anemia, this is a bone marrow problem. So you have, besides anemia, the patient also actually has um, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia as well. So here is your uh, that's anemia of course and then the patient also has neutropenia and thrombocytopenia let's go straight to uh, management so the management for uh, plastic anemia uh, can be uh, chemotherapy and radiation so here is your um, well we did already uh, discuss uh, chemo and therapy under uh, chapter 15 so it's no difference others are immunosuppressive therapy uh, because of course this is a autoimmune disorder so um, you're given um, on top of steroids here are some immune suppressants cyclosporin or cyclophosphamide uh, cyclosporin is a uh, calcineurin inhibitor uh, very commonly used drug for let's say um, to prevent organ rejection so it is a immunosuppressant uh, along with cyclophosphamide this is a anti-proliferative drug also used for cancer almost done with uh, anemia so now we have blood loss so we have acute and chronic blood loss so the um, depending on the, the severity will uh, determine also the management. So if it's, you saw the threshold earlier for blood transfusion, so we have uh, mild, moderate, and severe anemia. So if the patient reaches a threshold, usually below eight, millig uh, eight grams per deciliter of hemoglobin, then the patient will receive uh, blood transfusions. And of course, the treatment will be um, toward the cost of the blood loss for its acute blood loss trauma for instance and we stop the bleeding um, fractures etc for chronic blood loss which are usually from uh, GI bleeding um, then we manage that we stop the GI bleeding okay. so here should begin to correct itself once the source of that hemorrhage is stopped or controlled. Same thing for chronic blood loss. Let's go now to increase RBC uh, destruction. So our exemplar for this one will be sickle cell disease. Sickle cell is an inherited disorder. The main problem here is the patient contains a defective hemoglobin they have uh, hemoglobin s this type of hemoglobin be, uh, sickles or changes in shape uh, when exposed to certain triggers usually a, uh, a, a hypoxemic episode examples of hypoxemic episodes are if they're in a high altitude um, geography or they're flying you know in uh, in, up in a mountain or up uh, on an airplane uh, others are let's say they're in a tight area like in a bar where there's a lot of cigarette smoke so oxygen levels are low there 
or if they get sick let's say they have the flu or pneumonia for instance okay so any hypoxemic episode will trigger a crisis okay people with sickle cell disease can live um, relatively uh, almost normal lives however uh, because they just like uh, people with thalassemia who require blood transfusions this is really what will shorten their uh, life expectancy death will uh, usually occur from the from one of, or more of the blood transfusions that um, they will receive over the course of their lives they will have frequent hospitalizations for sickling because on top of the triggers I mentioned earlier stress can also cause a sickling episode so I mentioned some of these already so but all of them stem from a hypoxemic episode okay so these are some of the causes I mentioned so you got sick either the flu or uh, pneumonia uh, I already mentioned stress okay or even blood loss blood loss your um, oxygen level can potentially drop because you have less oxygen carrying blood cells okay. so a crisis is a defined as a severe painful acute exacerbation so when exposed to these triggers up here the red blood cells the with containing the hemoglobin s molecule will start to sickle so instead of having their normal this shape flat uh, 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 appearance of the red blood cells they become sickled or they assume a crescent shape now compared to a normal round this shape red blood cells who can um, run through uh, narrow capillaries or vessels with no problem they can squeeze through them not so for a sickle shape uh, red blood cell so since they cannot easily pass through blood vessels anymore they can eventually occlude vessels now these occlusions can occur in tight spaces like the joint for instance so patients will have frequently complaint of joint pain also uh, abdominal pain um, the pain is quite severe and um, therefore the patients will require lots of um, opioid uh, medications for pain relief uh, also during hospitalization the patients will be given large amounts of fluid uh, obviously to maintain circulation because again there's a lot of sickle, sickle RBCs here the hydration will help um, promote blood flow okay uh, smoking uh, can also trigger an episode some of these patients do smoke uh, so please make sure you encourage smoking cessation other causes of death are the following uh, tissue ischemia infarctions are possible or even necrosis okay, so uh, some uh, parts of their body will become necrotic so I mentioned pain is the uh, number one complaint for these patients during the episodes when they have uh, a crisis uh, during hemolysis the patient will present also with jaundice Okay, this is a sign of the destruction of the blood cells so they you know that will result in a lot of bilirubin being spilled in the bloodstream and then is therefore manifested on the skin uh, yellowing so yellowing of the eyes and the skin are possible the pain sites are the following so besides the joints the patient will also have back chest extremity or abdomen uh, abdominal pain a condition called 
sequestration of the spleen uh, is a life-threatening complication of sickle cell crisis although this thing that complication the uh, splenic sequestration is uh, commonly occurring only in children um, there has been documentations in adults uh, however what happens is there is a a lot of dead red blood cells at one time okay uh, in a short period of time overwhelming the spleen obstructing blood flow in the spleen so the spleen enlarges in such a, a small period of time uh, leading to severe anemia so the patient technically dies from shock so splenic um, sequestration uh, although um, rare in adults can be um, uh, possible in mostly children about 30 percent i think is the number about 30 percent of uh, children with uh, and infants with uh, sickle cell uh, disease um, die from that uh, complication uh, it's really from shock um, severely low um, hemoglobin levels because of a sickle cell crisis these patients will have splenomegaly or enlargement of the spleen because again the once these um, sickled cells I mean these uh, red blood cells sickle they do die and um, of course all dead red blood cells have to be uh, recycled in the spleen okay these patients are at risk for pneumonia uh, that's why they are encouraged to receive flu vaccines annually and then uh, pneumonia vaccines according to recommendations by the CDC Priapism, which is a painful erection, okay, persistent penile erection is possible um, during a sickling episode okay, because the what causes this is the um, red blood cells occluding the uh, vessels in the penis. Uh, management, I already said that um, prevention is good. No, that's the first start. We really don't want any sickling episodes uh, on these patients. So avoid the triggers mentioned earlier. So we tell them to avoid circumstances that will lead to hypoxemic episodes. Uh, here's the um, flu and pneumonia vaccination. Every crisis of course will require hospitalization and like I said these patients will require blood transfusions during these hospitalizations uh, there's the transfusion uh, pain management uh, fortunately these patients may be also labeled as drug seekers although that's really not the case here these patients are genuinely uh, in pain and because most of these patients are young they're either teenagers or uh, in their 20s 30s of course they will develop tolerance okay uh, these people are not new to opioids so with any person who receives opioids frequently of course we we will have to deal with opioid tolerance uh, and once tolerance occurs then these people will require higher doses of the medications so here's large doses of medications uh, PCAs will be beneficial for these patients because they ask for these pain medications quite frequently um, which will cause you know um, friction between them and nurses because um, let's say the medication is not due yet and they keep uh, pressing their call but call light uh, so it can cause some uh, tension between uh, the patient and the nurse so PCAs would help uh, prevent that from from happening although even with PCAs the patient may still call for a uh, as needed um, dose of the opioid 
hydroxyurea is not treatment I mean it's not a cure for sickle cell disease we have we are trying stem cell transplant now for curing SCD but again the challenge here is finding a match because we can't just transplant and it's just just about anyone's um, stem cell okay so you have to have proper matching and although the the registry for uh, stem cell transplantation stem cell donors you no know, uh, bone marrow donors is quite large they're in the millions if not a hundred million the matching is the problem it's quite hard to find a match so hydroxyurea is used not really again it's not a cure for sickle cell disease but it has been used to decrease the number of sickling episodes so when they're on this drug it will decrease the number of hospitalizations in these patients and that ends uh, hemo um, anemia it will stop at sickle cell anemia